Good morning. If you have your Bibles, please turn to First or Second Corinthians, chapter one. That's going to be a hard habit to break. First Corinthians. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23 is going to be our passage, and we're going to spill over into chapter 2. About a month ago, on one of my morning walks, I wasn't feeling very well, either physically or spiritually, and, and so I asked God there in the dark on a ditch bank somewhere to renew my joy in the Lord, that I would be able to know real joy in spite of you know, some difficult times. Well, God answered, but it wasn't like he just plopped down a lump of gooey, sticky joy on my head there in the dark. Um, You know, when we pray, we have to be willing to let God answer in his way, in his time, and he did that, but I never expected the answer that I got. If you fast forward a couple of weeks to just a couple of weeks ago when I started to study the passage for this message, and I'll just say I wasn't overly excited when I first read the passage that I had. In fact, it seemed to me that it was just more of Paul trying to explain to the Corinthians his travel plans. And if I could be so bold, it even sounded a little gratuitous. It's like Paul was saying, you know, I don't want to upset anybody. In fact, I just want everybody to be happy. Happy with me and me with you. And I don't want to cause anybody trouble. Well, let's go ahead and read it. The passage is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23 through 2-4. If you'll read God's word with me. Paul writes, But I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming to Corinth, not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, for by faith you stand. Chapter 2, verse 1. For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. For if I cause you pain, who will there be to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? As I wrote, and I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, Not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. Have you ever had the experience of coming to a passage of Scripture and you really don't know what to do with it? It's kind of a hard nut to crack. And as you work on it and you study it, it begins to work its way down into your mind and into your heart, into your life, and suddenly it begins to open up. And what was dust and stones before becomes gems and treasure. What was dry and dull suddenly gets juicy and, and, and satisfying. Well, that's what happened to me with this passage. In fact, it was through this passage that God answered that prayer for joy in a very powerful and unexpected way. And I just pray that I can communicate this in a way that imparts not just the message, but also some joy. So let's go ahead and ask God for that. Lord God, you, um, you spoke light into existence. You spoke a universe into existence. We know that you can speak joy into our hearts. And we would ask you to do that this morning as we just sang one day in your courts. Father, allow today to be that day. And tomorrow too. And the day after that. We ask you to be the wellspring of the joy in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I don't know about you, but when I first read this passage, I was, well, I'll just say the impact on me was minimal, except to say that I was a little bit worried how I was going to come up with a 35-minute sermon from six verses of Paul explaining why he decided to write a letter to the Corinthians instead of visiting them again. And that's basically what we have here. If you remember, when Paul planted the church at Corinth, he went there and he stayed for a year and a half just to help him get things rolling. And after that, he wrote another, he wrote a letter to him, a letter that we don't have. It's not in Scripture. It's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 5. And then he wrote 1 Corinthians. And after he wrote 1 Corinthians, instead of going and spending the winter with them like he expected, he made a quick visit to them, 
probably sailing across the ocean and back. And then he wrote another letter. That's the letter that we re just read about. And then he writes 2 Corinthians. There were problems in Corinth, and he was trying to help them get things straightened out. And at times, because they were real problems, relationships got strained. So here in our passage, in verse 23, chapter 1, Paul calls God as his witness that he decided not to visit Corinth again because he wanted to spare them an, an unpleasant visit. He says, but I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming to Corinth again. I call God as a witness against me. In other words, if this isn't true, may God strike me down. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. He said, I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. So apparently Paul's most recent visit to him had been a difficult one for him as well as for them. And <clears throat> even though they were expecting Paul to come back, <clears throat> Paul made the decision to refrain from going back to Corinth and, and to simply write this letter because he was afraid that another visit at that point would cause more harm than good in the relationships that he had in Corinth, relationships that were already strained. What a great example of patience in ministry to people. Right? You know, Matthew 5 and Matthew 18 tell us if you get crosswise with somebody, go to them and talk to them and be reconciled. And we often forget that Matthew 7 is, right in, bet is in between Matthew 5 and Matthew 18. Matthew 7 where Jesus says, don't run off right away and confront them. Look at the log in your own eye before you help them with the speck. The first thing we do in conflict is not confront. The first thing we do is look within and humble ourselves before we go barging in like a bull in a china shop. So here, Paul models for us the principle of being sensitive to the Spirit's leading because the people we're working with might need room to grow. So instead of going off to Corinth and confronting the problem, trying to set everything straight, Paul considered what that might do to his relationships there, and he just decided to write a letter instead. It wasn't an easy letter. It was a heart-wrenching letter. Look at verse 4 again. He says in verse 4, chapter 2, For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. And as I considered this, and with the help of a lot of people a lot smarter than me, like Jonathan Edwards and, and John Piper and, and Paul Tripp, it became apparent that this wasn't Paul just explaining his decision-making process to the church in Corinth. But instead, the Holy Spirit was explaining Paul's mission, our mission, as we are ministers of the New Covenant. Paul was explaining his whole life purpose here. And this is what became so exciting to me. So go back to verse 24 in chapter 1. And this is the verse we're going to spend most of our time focusing on this morning. Paul writes, Not that we lord it over your faith. Discipleship for Paul wasn't bossing people around. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy. For by faith you stand. Literally, he says, for we are co-workers with you for your joy. Paul says, that's why I'm on earth. That's why I'm here, to bring you joy. When it was all boiled down, the essence of everything for Paul was that he would work to make people happy in Jesus. Now, before you dismiss that as some kind of sappy sentimentalism, I want you to consider what it cost Paul in his life to do this. Turn to chapter 11. 2 Corinthians, it's just a few pages away. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In chapter 11, Paul is defending himself against these super apostles who had come into Corinth and were messing things up in Corinth. And so he says to the people there in verse 23, are they servants of Christ? Are these super apostles servants of Christ? Well, I'm a better one. Now as soon as Paul writes that, he realizes that sounded foolish. Right? And so he says, I'm talking like a madman. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. Five times 
I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less than one. Can you imagine what Paul's back looked like? He's not a young man. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. When Paul says that he is working for the joy of his people, that's what it looked like. It was costly. Paul is risking his life for their joy. This is what New Covenant ministry is. We lay down our lives for people. We set our lives aside for their joy. And when I say we, I'm not talking about some mythical creature called clergy. I don't even know what that is, and I know we don't have it around here. When I say we, I'm talking about us. I'm talking about people who are born again by the blood of Jesus. I know here at Bethel I'm talking to a lot of people as I look around this room who are involved in ministry to other folks, helping other people see the glory of God. We don't have designated ministers here at Bethel Bible Fellowship. We are all called to be workers in the kingdom. And so we support each other in that, and we work together in that. And so if you're doing that and you're working to promote the glory of God in people's lives, helping people with that kind of a ministry, then I'm talking to you this morning. This whole sermon, that's what it is. Actually, Paul's talking to you. Well, the Holy Spirit inspired it. So the Holy Spirit is talking to us through this. And what we see here in verse 24 is not just a passing comment of Paul. This is the Holy Spirit describing what gospel ministry looks like. Paul says... Your joy is my mission. This is why I'm here. This is my reason for being. Your joy. And this is what we do in ministry, folks. We lay down our lives for people, for their joy. So in verses 1 and 2 in chapter 2, he says, I am working for your joy, and that is my joy. When you're glad, I'm glad, Paul says. Your joy is my joy. And if I cause you pain, then who will there be to bring me joy? And then in verse 3, at the end of the verse, he says, my joy is your joy. Look at the end of the verse, verse 3. He said, I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. That you would be happy and that therefore I would be happy. And then in verse 4, he says, basically, the anguish and the tears that went into this letter is a demonstration of Paul's great love for them. When Paul works for the joy of others, he calls that love. That's how he describes and defines love. That's what a loving ministry looks like, working for their joy. So if you're involved in ministry this morning, understand this. People feel loved when they know that your joy is their joy. That's what love looks like in ministry. Now, all of this could sound really superficial, right? Pretty shallow. I'm just here to make you happy so that you can make me happy, so that we can all be happy and we can come together on Sunday morning and have a big group hug and pat each other on the back and be happy together, right? Now, obviously, that's not what this passage is teaching. God isn't promoting some kind of sappy, syrupy sentimentalism here, although it sounds like that if we're not careful. But if we do, if we just come here as some kind of mutual admiration society where we pat each other on the back and try to get each other to feel good about ourselves, well, that's carnal and that's fleshly. And that's not what God's talking about here. No, when we read these words this morning, we have to remember the whole context of the book that we're reading, 2 Corinthians. This letter is all about the gospel. It's about living in the shadow of the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, it's not like Paul left that out of our passage. Look back at verse 24, chapter 1. A literal reading of verse 24 would be, we do not lord it over your faith. Paul says, our discipleship is not us bossing you around. 
but we are fellow workers with you for your joy. For by faith we stand. Did you notice that clause begins with faith and ends with faith and it has joy in the middle? It's a joy sandwich. What do we have here? Let's look at the first two clauses. Paul says, we, we do not lord it over your faith, but we are fellow workers with you for your joy. Paul's drawing a contrast here. But it's not a contrast between faith and joy. It's a contrast between the verbs. Lording it over or working together. That's the contrast. He says, we don't lord it over your faith, but we are fellow workers with you for your blank. Fill in the blank. Now, if I was reading that to you for the very first time and you didn't have the scriptures in front of you, and I stopped right there, what would you put in that blank? Let me read it again. We don't lord it over your faith, but we are fellow workers with you for your... That's what I would do. I would put faith in there. But we are fellow workers with you for your faith. But Paul says joy instead. Strange, isn't it? It's almost as though he interchanges joy and faith, as though they are somehow dynamically and inextricably linked. And they are. That's the point. That's why he said it. <laughs> this word, faith, is talking about a deep, eternal trust in the crucified Savior. That's what faith is. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. Maybe we can see it a little bit more clearly there. Philippians chapter 1, verse 23. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 23, Paul's talking about you know, his hope to leave the world and go to heaven, but he's got this tension in his life because he knows he, he should probably stay and keep working for people and for their joy. And so in verse 23 of Philippians 1, he writes, For I'm hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain, and I shall continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith. And joy of faith. Now, I just read from the New King James Version. If you're reading from the King James or the New King James, that's what it says, joy of faith. And the reason I read it from that is that is the literal translation of the Greek here. It doesn't, Paul doesn't say here that he's working for their progress and joy in the faith. He's talking about working for their joy of faith. Those words are linked. The joy of faith. In other words, faith brings joy. It's like this, when you embrace Christ and your faith recognizes that Jesus is the incomparable treasure of the universe, joy happens. What happens to you when somebody hands you a treasure and you know it's yours now? Joy happens. It reminds me of that parable that Jesus told us, one of my favorite parables of Jesus it's, it's the shortest parable, I think. It's, it's in Matthew 13, 44. I'll read it to you. Jesus, trying to explain to them what the realm of God is like, says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his great joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Now, did he sell everything he had because of his great commitment? Because of a strong sense of duty? No. No. No, he did it because the joy of the treasure had gripped his heart, dominated his mind, and filled him with delight. And that is exactly what Jesus wanted to communicate to us in that parable. When faith sees God as he truly is, his glory and his love and his mercy and his grace and his power and his majesty and his redemption and his might, and his unbridled, passionate pursuit of our lost souls, and his humility on the cross, his humiliation on the cross, and the triumph of his resurrection over death, when faith sees that, you're happy. It fills you with joy. In fact, you can't see that and not delight in it. 
In fact, if you don't delight in it, you don't see it yet. Not with eyes of faith. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, you can turn there, it's one page away. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Paul says, in their case, the God of this world, that's Satan, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. What, is this, what does the devil not want us to see? What is it that Satan cannot afford for us to see? Or he'll lose us. He'll lose any hold that he had on us. He cannot afford for us to see the glory of Christ. He can't afford for us to see the beauty and the majesty of the risen Lord. So what is our job as ministers of the new covenant? Which is what you are if you're born again. Well, in Acts 26, Paul explains. He's explaining to Agrippa, King Agrippa, his testimony. And he explains to Agrippa that our job is to open the eyes of the blind. He tells Agrippa, Jesus told me, I am sending you to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Now, of course, it's the Holy Spirit who opens eyes, but God uses the likes of us to do it. Our job as Jesus ambassadors is to help people see the glory and the majesty of and the magnificence of Jesus Christ. Because when they do, when they truly see him with eyes of faith, the result will be a joy that drives them toward the treasure, toward a vibrant, eternal love affair with Jesus Christ. That's our job, to help people fall in love with Jesus. Not to win arguments, to help them see Christ. If we could get them to walk on a, on a seashore for 30 minutes with Jesus, they'd never go back to all their other gods. They would fall in love with him. So when I say that I am a worker together with you for your joy, I don't mean that it's my job to make you feel good or to pamper you or to pass out warm hugs regardless of your response to God's word. No. No, when I say that I am a worker for joy in the lives of the students down at Mesilla Valley Christian Schools. I don't mean that it's my job to get them to have fun playing music on the deck of the Titanic while it sinks. No, no, I teach biology and chemistry and physics and anatomy and ecology so that they will see God's eternal power and his divine attributes and the things that he's made. So that their hearts will long for real treasure, for truly satisfying, eternal joy in the presence of the King, the lover of our souls. Why did Jesus come to us? Do you remember sermon on, or the um, upper room discourse, the Last Supper, John chapter 15? Jesus told his disciples, abide in my love so that your joy may be full. Wow. Now, Jesus knew what he was talking about there when he used the word joy. He knew that his disciples were not going to gracefully grow old sitting around a campfire singing Kumbaya until his return. No, his joy was not going to be a superficial happiness fueled by acquiring and spending and fun experiences on this earth. No, Jesus' joy, the joy that Jesus brings to us is a joy that transcends this world. It is a joy that is completely disconnected from this world and it shatters the expectations of this world. So much so that it amazes this world when they see it in us. They can't understand it. See, Jesus came to give us a joy that would shine in the darkest times because he gives us a joy that was forged on a Roman cross. A joy that shines brighter and brighter in the shadow of that cross, in the midst of pain and, and grief. It's a joy that echoes the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, when he said, Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you on my account. Rejoice and be glad 
For so men persecuted the prophets who came before you. Rejoice and be glad. Now that's Matthew 5, 11, and 12. Does anybody remember what Matthew 5, 13 says? You are the salt of the earth. And Matthew 4, 5, 14, you are the light of the world. We like to call ourselves salt and light. What is the context of salt and light in Matthew 5. In other words, what was in Jesus' mind when he called us salt and light? He had just been talking about it. It's persecution and suffering and pain and grief and insults. That's the context of us being salt and light. See, the joy that we're working for in people's lives as ministers of the gospel is not a sentimental high that's based on materialism. No, what we are entrusted with is the message of the cross and a joy that's established on the extravagance of the cross in the love of God. That's our treasure. And that's our joy. And as ministers of the new covenant, that's our task. To be building disciples who are rejoicing in Christ. To be building disciples who are ready for the day of trouble. Our job is to prepare people's hearts so they're ready to suffer. Because we've all been called to the cross. It's our calling. Take up your cross daily and follow me. So our job is to work with people until they are so lost in the grandeur and the splendor of Jesus that they shine like stars in the joy of their King. Brighter and brighter, no matter how dark this world becomes. See, the greatest testimony that you and I have to the world around us is not our sense of duty or our great sacrifice. It's our joy and tribulation. That's what they don't understand. They're not impressed by our commitment, but they are utterly dumbfounded by a Christian who doesn't lose his joy even when everything in life is falling apart around him. They simply can't explain Christ-centered, cross-focused power when everything else in life has been torn away. But they will notice it, and many will be won to Christ because of it. Because your joy is contagious, and they'll catch it. It's not a joy that's based on your wealth, It's not a joy that's based on your health. It's not a joy that's based on your success or your reputation or your anything. It is based solely and firmly on the lavish love and opulent grace of Jesus Christ as seen in the cross. So that when life is tough, we can say, it is well. It is well with my soul. I would like to share with you just a few words from a friend of mine. He was a student of mine once here at Mesilla Valley. He's married now. He has two little boys. In September, his wife had a seizure. So they went to the doctor, and within a couple of days, she was under the knife, and they removed a brain tumor from her brain. It's been over a month now, and this past Monday, he shared this with his prayer team. Quote, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. Over the last five weeks, this song has been playing constantly in my mind. An American lawyer named Horatio Spafford wrote these words after his four daughters died on their way to England for a family vacation. He he knows more of sorrow than I can claim to have experienced, yet his words have resonated in my heart as we have walked this journey of stage four cancer. I have walked beside the gently flowing river of peace and have been tossed in the turbulent seas of sorrow. I have wept over the words of this song and I have also sung them confidently and joyfully. On the Saturday before Alyssa's surgery, she asked Kim and me to sit in in a room and sing to her while we held her hands. I sang, Let me call you sweetheart. And then I started to sing, It is well. I got out the first five words and then started weeping and shaking silently, unable to go on. We were truly tossed into turbulent seas and I was overwhelmed. 
Yet I promised myself that I would learn to sing and live the words of that song, that no matter the circumstances that life brought, I would trust God, that he is still good, that he is still in charge of all things, and that he loves me. Today was the first day since the surgery that I have played piano for church. <clears throat> when I first talked with our worship pastor, Greg, about playing today, I thought about asking him if we could sing It Is Well as a testament to the last month. When I learned that Greg would be out of town this Sunday, I decided not to ask. But when I got to worship practice, I found that our backup worship leader had already chosen to sing that song this Sunday. It was one more example of God's grace in this time, a small but tangible reminder of his love and provision, even in the darkest of times. Sunday morning found me sitting at the piano leading our church in song. Tears filled my eyes as I played. And I thought about all those whose hearts were breaking with us as we walked through the dark, ni dark nights of cancer. And I thought about Horatio Spafford, who penned these words as he traveled across that stretch of ocean where his daughters had drowned. It is well. It is well does not mean that we are happy or carefree. It is well does not mean that life is free from sorrows, sickness, or even death. It is well means that I know whose I am. No matter what else happens, I am deeply loved by God. Alyssa is deeply loved by God. She is his daughter, and he carries her in his loving arms. This does not shelter us from pain, but it gives us a hope beyond the pain, a hope that declares that even death cannot separate us from God's presence. Or, as Alyssa puts it, even if it's not okay, it'll be okay. Whatever my lot, you have taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. That's the peace and joy that Paul's talking about when he wrote to the, to the Corinthians in verse 24. I am working with you for your joy. And that's what we do in each other's lives. Co-workers together working for joy, that kind of joy in each other's lives. And God does the same thing for us in our lives. He's working together with us for our joy. A joy and a peace that passes all understanding. Now you might say, well, if that's what I've been called to, if this is my mission in life as a, as a minister of the gospel, to work with God and with people for their joy, how do I do that? I don't know what to do. Well, my best advice would be stay tuned because that's what this letter is about. It's about how to be ministers of the new covenant. But for this morning, let me just say, uh, one of the reasons we were created was to glorify God and to praise Him. What does that mean, to glorify God? To oversimplify it, it means to make God look good, to brag on God. So in your ministry, whatever it is, you know, whether you're speaking up here from the pulpit or you're sharing a devotion at the breaking of bread or in a Bible study or a Sunday school or a public prayer that you're praying or in private conversation or just giving people advice or counsel, whatever it is, my advice is brag on God. Make God look good. Help people treasure Christ above all else. Portray God in Christ as supremely desirable. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So I guess the best advice I can give you here is to say, treasure Christ above all else in your heart. And then the abundance of your heart will spill out of your mouth as you interact with people. As you feed your heart and your mind and your soul on the magnificence of Jesus Christ, in his unsurpassed worth. Get into the Word. Not just as a book, but as the living and active words of God written to you, and read it with an eye for his majesty and his worth. Listen to music. Good music that builds you up and fortifies your soul. Spend time with God's people, other people who love Jesus and can build that into your life. And read good books. Fiction and nonfiction, books that allow you to gaze at the splendor and the worth 
of Jesus Christ. Jesus told us, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus told us that we are to love God, treasure God with our whole being, right? The mental, the spiritual, the emotional, the physical, the relational, the volitional, all of us. And one way we can do that is ourselves, to be feeding and nourishing our whole self on the glory of God. And that's what we do. And as we do that, we will grow. And joy will grow in us. And we will grow in our ability to work with each other for joy in each other's lives. Now the operative word in there that I just used was grow. It's a process. It's not going to happen overnight. Right? It's like an oak tree growing. It's imperceptible. As somebody once said, we have holes in our buckets. Right? I have a leaky bucket. I get up in the morning and I go to the fountain of life and I stick out my bucket and by, you know, it doesn't take very long before I have to go back and fill up my bucket because my bucket leaks. It's kind of the way he engineered the whole thing. It's like eating, right? God gave us the necessity of eating to stay nourished. But you never quite arrive. You're never nourished for good now. Okay, I, I don't have to eat anymore. I'm good. That'll give me you know, a couple of hours every day if I don't have to eat and prepare food. Wouldn't that be nice? Right? You, you eat, and, and before long, you feel like you need to eat again. And so, in order to stay nourished, we have to be persistent about eating. But God made it easy on us because he filled eating with pleasure and delight and joy. And it's exactly the same thing in our spiritual lives and our relationship with him. When it comes to feeding on him and drinking from his fountain of living water, in order to stay nourished, in order to be able to help other people grow in their joy in Christ, we have to be constantly and persistently nourishing ourselves from the bread of life and the living water. Seeking our joy and our delight in Him every day, all throughout the day. George Mueller, that great man of God, once wrote in his journal, he said, I saw more clearly than ever that the first and primary business for me to which I must attend every day was to have my soul happy in the Lord. Not how much I might serve the Lord or what I might do for others, but how I might get my soul into a happy state and how in my inner man I might be nourished. I am of no use to anybody until I get my heart happy in the Lord. And when we do that, we will be able to say with Paul that we work together with you for your joy when we minister to people. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, my one prayer is that you would win the battle in our hearts for our affections, that we would value and treasure you above all else, that we would seek our satisfaction and our delight in you alone. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.